to know public figures through headlines, policy proposals, and speeches. It's another thing entirely to know them as a personal friend. Our guests tonight offer a rare window into the life of President J George H.W. Bush, revealing a man of extraordinary character and dedication to his country. Good evening and welcome to the program. Thanks for joining us. I'm Liz Brailsford, President and CEO of the World Affairs Council of Dallas-Fort Worth. Our program tonight feature, features Gene Becker, President Bush's Chief of Staff and author of The Man I Knew, joined in conversation by Pulitzer Prize winner, winning presidential historian John Meacham and writer Chris Buckley. You can purchase your copies of The Man I Knew, The Amazing Story of George H.W. Bush's Post-Presidency at Interabang Books, our local bookstore partner. And our audience receives a 10% discount from the Interabang Books online store by using the code DFWWORLD. And remember, it's good for any of the books in your shopping cart, not just Jean's book. I'd like to take a moment to recognize our program partners and good friends at the Center for Presidential History at SMU. Thank you for being with us tonight. We have a full schedule of virtual programs, so remember to check out our website at dfwworld.org for newly scheduled events. And on that note, we are all craving in-person connection uh, we here at the council are talking a lot about that. We are moving back in the direction of in-person and we'll be releasing more information about that soon. So please uh, stay abreast of our newsletters and on our website and uh, we'll get back to in-person as soon as we can, which will be before too long. A few can tell such wonderful stories about President Bush's life and character as, as our guests tonight. Jean Becker met, met George H.W. and Barbara Bush through her election coverage for USA Today, making such an impression on the First Lady that she was offered a job as her Deputy Press Secretary. She became Bush 41's interim Chief of Staff in 94, through interim, though interim turned into a quarter century as she remained so until his passing in 2018, overseeing events like the opening of his presidential library and college station and his state funeral. Jean worked with the First Lady to publish two memoirs with Bush, President Bush on his own and now continues upholding his legacy with The Man I Knew, The Amazing Story of George H.W. Bush's Post-Presidency. Chris Buckley served as chief speechwriter to Bush during his vice presidency. He's a prolific author and political satirist known for novels such as The White House Mess and Thank You for Smoking, which, have been adapted, which has been adapted into a feature film. And finally, but not least, John Meacham is a Pulitzer Prize winning author and renowned presidential historian. As Bush's official biographer, he studied the former president's extensive diaries to write Destiny and Power, the American Odyssey of George Herbert Walker Bush, which reached number one on the New York Times bestseller list in 2015. I know for a fact uh, and I know this because I've just been chatting with them behind the scenes, that we are in for an absolutely fascinating and insightful, fun conversation, how lucky we are to have this group together. And so uh, with that, Jean, I turn it over to you. Thanks to the, uh, all three of you, again, for joining us. It means a lot, and we are extremely excited. Thank you, Liz. I am delighted to be here tonight with the Dallas World Affairs Council. I must say, I'm about ready to be proved to be either the most brilliant person in America or the dumbest. We may have to have a vote when this is over because I invited these two gentlemen, Christopher Buckley and John Meacham, to join me tonight. Uh, brilliant because they're funny. They knew and loved the Bushes. Possibly not brilliant because in about two minutes, it's possible I'm going to completely lose control of the entire evening. So I will apologize in advance if I have to, I may have to do some yelling at some point. But uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining me to talk about a man that, that we all knew very well. And Chris, we're going to start with you because you knew him first. And I'm good. I would love for them to show the photo 
that you sent to be shared with all of us. And I want you to talk about what's happening in this photo and just a little bit about your relationship with George Bush. Gene, uh, uh, thank you. Great to be here. Your, your book is wonderful. Uh, and uh, I'm so happy that it's flying off the shelves. Um, this photo, uh, you're looking at uh, the, in the cabin of Air Force Two in 1981. Uh, uh, the then Vice President Bush went, did a, uh, a, a one week swing through Latin America. Uh, Richard Nixon famously, uh, they, it's a, a ritual of, of humiliation to send an American vice president to Latin America to be jeered and, and have rocks thrown at him. But actually, Mr. Bush was <laughs> so nice that they didn't do that. But anyway, we were uh, at the end of a, a very tiring week. We had been prom, we were in Rio, Rio de Janeiro, Rio by the CEO. Oh, mio, oh, mio. And we had uh, been promised a night uh, of R&R. &R. Uh, and, uh, you can't spell R&R &R without the R in Rio. At which point, Mr. Bush decided eh, he wanted to fly home so he could play tennis with James Baker the next morning. So the mood was ugly uh, aboard Air Force Two. <laughs> And uh, a coup was organized, and it, it, I was uh, uh, sort of a kangaroo kind of uh, deal. But anyway, I was the, uh, the spokesman. So I uh, <clears throat> seized uh, uh, control of the PA system. That's the first thing you do in a revolution. You know, you, you have to get the radio station. In this case, it was the microphone. And in a, uh, my best Spanish accent, I declared that... Uh, the uh, the uh, there had been a revolution and the uh, we used to call uh, uh, Mr. Bush the Vishnu. That's another story. Uh, and I announced that the Vishnu had been deposed. Um, it was uh, thought very funny in the cabin. The the Air Force the the uh, uh, the Air Force security guards weren't you know they sort of rushed back and and anyway what you see here is is Mr. Bush ending the revolution by turning the volume knob on my PA system down from 11 to zero. And uh, I asked that- uh, So let me get this straight. You tried to overthrow the vice president yes, of the United States. Yes, and you know, Gene, uh, Gene we came this close. Uh, <laughs> uh -huh. the, the, the history of the American history at the end of the uh, 20th century could have been uh, very different. But I asked him to sign the, uh, uh, the, the picture later. And uh, so it reads, uh, Chris Buckley, the Vishnu's semantic guru, who is forgiven for revolution failed, but whose probation includes 14 speeches per week, all on the theme, respect for the office. <laughs> So I, I don't know if this is going to be a relief or a disappointment to all our viewers tonight. This story is not in my book. Since during the VP years, I don't know, I was in high school, I think. <laughs> no, I, no, no, I, I was out. I was out in the adult world. Uh, but uh, this just sort of gives you an idea of the relationship that Chris had with the Bushes. And we're going to fast forward, Christopher, to the post-White House years. Uh, which is my era with George and Barbara Bush. I would love for you to tell me, one of, tell all of us, one of my favorite stories and how Barbara Bush tried to rein you in at dinner one night. Tell us your crime and tell us what happened. <clears throat> we, uh, <clears throat> there was a dinner party of, about, of eight. I had given a, a talk about Mr. Bush uh, with uh, uh, Mr. Bush right there in the, in the front row. It was a sort of an eerie, weird reversal of our original roles. But um, it was uh, essentially a 45 minute uh, ode, a love ode to him. And we went out uh, for dinner after. And uh, 
<clears throat> Mr. Bush uh, ordered a martini from the young sort of college student uh, uh, waitress. And Mrs. Bush said, uh, no, George, you're not having a martini. You've been sick. You've been on antibiotics for 10 days. You're not having a, a martini. Forget it. So I, I, I sensed that my beloved Mr. Bush really wanted a martini. So I caught her eye, the waitress's eye, and said, you know, just bring it. So uh, she uh, appeared with the martini, which she sat down in front of him. <laughs> Mrs. Bush <laughs> regarded it with horror. But, uh, Mr. Bush's hand went out faster than a mongoose <laughs> after a cobra and, and, and established ownership. So uh, Mrs. Bush, my wife was, was there and she's a doctor. Uh, and so she, uh, to try to defuse the situation, asked Mrs. Bush what kind of antibiotic uh, he, Mr. Bush had been on. Mrs. Bush wasn't having any of that. She said, you stay out of it. So he, he finished his first martini pretty quickly. The waitress came back and I, I caught her eye again, said, yeah, bring him another. Again, the presidential hand shot out like a jack in the box. And this time, uh, <laughs> Mrs. Bush hit me uh, quite, quite hard. So I have been smacked by, uh, by a first lady uh, with a, a pretty powerful, uh, she had a pretty powerful cross jab. Well, she, she probably remembers the coup attempt from the vice presidential <laughs> years and decided to whip you into shape, Mr. Buckley. I, it, I spent a lot of fun times watching you all laugh and interact with each other. I'm not sure I would exactly use the same um, adjectives to describe watching John Meacham with President and Mrs. Bush. In the book, both Chris and John play a big role in this book. Um, Christopher Buckley used to ask President Bush to write essays and letters for him for, for, for your magazine. What, tell us a little bit, just briefly, what President Bush would write for you. Well, my afterlife, uh, 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 my after speech writing life uh, was as an editor at Forbes. And I asked him uh, to do a, uh, <clears throat> write a piece on 10 rules for former presidents. And, um, and he did, and they are indeed in, in your book. They're in, they're in the book, and there's a couple of other pieces in the book. Yeah, he wrote you asked him to write. a total of five or six. He wrote, the first one he did was on uh, uh, his, his famous parachute jump. It was called Getting It Right. You may recall, <laughs> well, yeah, I think you two recall. <laughs> But he, uh, he, he, he used to say that he, he you know, he, he, uh, he didn't get the parachute uh, uh, exit right. And he, it had bugged him all his life and he, he, he wanted to finally get it right. So at age 75, he starts hurling himself out of planes <laughs> with regularity. Another, another more delight for Mrs. Bush there. Um, it Quite frankly, you guys, it should irritate the three of us what a great writer President Bush was. Mm -hmm. He was such a great writer. And it did irritate me because I feel like all of us should just have one God-given talent. His talent was to be President of the United States. It's not fair for, for, for also to be such a good writer. But Chris, I'm grateful to you that you asked him to write all those essays. Uh, and a lot of them are in the book. And I really don't want to talk to them because I want to talk about them now because I want everybody watching to read the book. Uh, read the book and, and sample some of President Bush's great writing that he did for Chris Buckley. It's some of my favorite parts of the book. Um, I think we need to pivot to Mr. Meacham. And this is the absolute truth. There is a chapter in the book, an entire chapter called The Worst of Times. And it's in this chapter in which I talk about the relationship with John Meacham. When he came, in, <laughs> when he came into our life to write Destiny and Power, it's one of the toughest decisions I had to make as President Bush's chief of staff to, to and really as President Bush made the decision 
to co fully cooperate with John. But John, why don't you talk about just a little bit about how you came into our life? And were you also ever slapped by Barbara Bush like Chris Buckley was? She preferred verbal abuse uh, for me. Uh, I, I will say one serious thing, and then we'll we'll, we'll get on. Uh, I hope all of you all watching know that uh, George Herbert Walker Bush and Barbara Pierce Bush loved many people, but there was a special place in their hearts for both uh, Gene Becker and Christopher, uh, who are two of my great friends and worthy of that love. And so now we'll get to the good stuff. Um, I asked President Bush to write something. I'll get to your question in a little while. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, I asked President Bush once to write me a letter about women he had been interested in before Mrs. Bush. Oh. And three pages single-spaced came back. Now, remember. I cannot believe you're bringing that up. It's <laughs> You invite, we, there, there's also an ejector seat. So if I go out of the way, y'all will know. Um, but of course they met at Christmas, 1941. Uh, so th there wasn't a lot of time between June 12th, 1924 and uh, December 27th, 28th of 1941. But he remembered each of them and wrote this single spaced typewritten letter. And the greatest line of which was, I remember, and I've lost her name now, uh, I remember her form, I don't remember what I had for lunch today, but I remember the form-fitting rubber bathing suit that a girl from Abbott Academy had been, had been wearing. And at some occasion at the library, uh, I decided to read that letter. And Mrs. Bush, I don't think the phrase, if looks could kill, quite captures the, uh, the Scud missiles that were coming in. And she later took me aside and said, well, I don't think Boobs Malloy would have been a very good first lady. I said, yes, ma'am, you're exactly right. Boobs <laughs> Malloy would not have been a very good first lady. And then I ran for the barbecue line. Um, the other, my, my most fabled story to me is uh, in 2008, uh, when I was about 10 years into the 17 year journey that, that became the book. Uh, I was at the National Book Festival on the mall that Mrs. B Laura Bush had been so instrumental in. And I was on my way at that point to give my talk about Andrew Jackson. And a woman ran up to me and said, oh my God, it's you. And I said, well, yes, you know, I'm no Christopher Buckley, but yes, I, I <laughs> and she said, I just, I love your books. They've meant so much to me. Will you wait right here? I'm going to go buy your new book and have you sign it. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I thought this was a twofer, right? This was a woman ran up to me, which doesn't happen enough. Uh, she was buying the book. It was a retail coup. This was perfect. She brought back John Grisham's latest novel. So and of course I signed it. So the next day, that was a Saturday. And I was, I was going to uh, Maine to see the Bushes. And for some reason, uh, it was just the three of us at lunch. And as Gene knows, and Christopher knows so well, usually when you went to lunch at the Bushes, the Oak Ridge Boys and Gorbachev and the Lobster Men would be there, you know, and, you know, and, you know, uh, Billy Graham would be putting, you know, it was a very, it was like a wasp Epcot, uh, functionally. <laughs> and, but it was just us. And so I told the story and I will confess to my friends, it was an entirely transparent attempt to get either the former president or the former first lady to say, oh, you're so much more important than John Grisham. Barbara Bush looks across the table in that inimitable way and says, well, how do you think poor John Grisham would feel? You know, he's a very handsome man. <laughs> So it was, it was a bad weekend. It, it is, it is one of my favorite stories. I, I loved her even more, John, after she said I know, that. I know. Um, so I met uh, through Gene's uh, good offices. Michael Beschloss and I went to Maine uh, in September of 1998. Uh, General Scowcroft and President Bush had published their book, A World Transformed. As I recall, the first draft of the first chapter was 340 pages long, Gene, I think. Yes. Um, and so we, we did an interview. And as Gene will remember, at that time, I was uh, at Newsweek, which would be for the Bush family to invite someone from Newsweek would be like 
the Bush Center today inviting someone who had been at Saddam Hussein's magazine network. You know, it was not, there were not diplomatic relations at that point. So I brought a cake and a Bible and I, I came along <laughs> and he had decided we had been summoned for 7 a.m. so that we would be gone by 8 and the president <laughs> would have his day. And so, true story. So, Veshlos and I you know, stagger you know, through the fog of Maine and we do the interview. And, but it goes better, I think, than the president expected. So, we end up having lunch. And as I recall, the Gatlin brothers and David Rubenstein were in house. As well, oh, and John Major was there. And John Major. Yeah. John Major, Major was also there. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just another day in Bushland. Uh, and we ended up, we missed our flight. We went on the boat. Uh, Gene and Beschloss were allowed to sit behind the uh, windshield. I was not. And I realized later it was an attempt to kill me, uh, to get me thrown off the boat because he went at such, at such speed. But what happened in that on that day, and then I got a marvelous letter from him uh, that was largely about the Clinton impeachment, uh, which we won't get into, but um, was I, I was an undergraduate through most of President Bush's uh, presidency, and I spent most of my time. My roommate at the University of the South was from Lynchburg, Tennessee. His name was Jack Daniels. So I was a little fuzzy about a lot of what had happened. I thought the Gulf War had something to do with Destin. Um, but I did have this very 1992 Dana Carvey-like view of President Bush. And in the course of that day, I realized, oh, if you have to trust the fate of your nation and the fate of your family to a single person, this is a perfectly rational choice, this man. And I was perennially fascinated unto this hour by the distinction between what he was like in person and the way he presented on television. And I think that I'm so grateful for so many reasons that he lived so long, but Gene and I've talked about this a lot, but he did live to see the country catch up. The country went through the same kind of thing I did uh, by the time he died. And he was genuinely seen, uh, I think, as a man in full. I think uh, it's part of why I wrote the book, John, um, to help America understand truly the depth of this man. He truly, he left us a blueprint on how to live a life well lived. Mm -hmm. uh, he lived with joy. He lived with humor. He lived with substance. He was, he was one of the most interesting people any of us will ever know. I am proud of John for not pointing out, but it is in the book. The day of this boat ride with John and Michael Beschloss, John Major was too smart to go on the boat. <laughs> it was a very rough day. We went way out in the Atlantic Ocean because President Bush wanted to show John an island that where there had been a shipwreck. Right. years earlier and the the survivors had practiced cannibalism <laughs> i was always me. surprised john after that you actually came back i did come back and i got a note and chris chris will appreciate this given what he does and 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 gene as as well sometime after that jackson book so sometime during the john grisham gate um he wrote me a note I decided I decided uh, to do the Bush book after the Jackson book, and then other things intervened. But the title of the Jackson book was American Lion. And he wrote me a note saying, I'm no lion. It's intimidating to be in the footsteps of Andrew Jackson. But of course, he was. And Gene captures it brilliantly and wonderfully uh, in this. One of the things I want to ask you, Gene, is did you did you have a similar kind of journey with him? I, I know I know he went from being intimidating to being someone you loved, but as those years went on, my sense is you discovered, if not hidden depths, at least obscured ones. Uh, that's a great question, John. 
And the answer is absolutely. I agreed to be his chief of staff just temporarily. He asked me to fill in for a summer while he hired a new chief of staff. And I told him I would be his chief of staff for six months. And I was his chief of staff for 25 years. It, he was a very hard man to leave. But what you discovered about him was, was not only the fun part and the wild roller coaster ride, the jumping out of airplanes and um, the practical jokes, but the hidden depths of this man, the fact that he needed to go back to Chichijima, which we did, which is was one of the probably the most fascinating trips I took with him. He was shot, shot down on Chichijima September 2nd, 1944, as a 20-year-old, and he went back what, 50 years, 60 years later, because he needed to go back to where he lost his two crew members. He, his, his, the, he had substance and depth that I don't think, sometimes he even wanted us to know. One time I'm watching him read a book, we're in a car, and he's reading an autobiography of some historic figure. And he said to me, don't tell anyone, I don't want anyone to know how smart I am. <laughs> And I said, okay. But of course, the other thing, he had the biggest heart and he truly lived what he preached. He used to say a lot that any definition of successful life must include serving others. It's the whole principle on which he founded Points of Light. It is a principle on which he became friends with William Jefferson Clinton, the man who defeated him, because they found in each other a common good and a common cause to help people whose lives had been turned upside down by disaster. And President Bush was the kind of person who put, a, who put aside the politics, the disagreements, the hurt of 1992 to do this, to see this picture. This is, this is them in Sri Lanka after the tsunami in 2005 and watching him navigate something as complicated as becoming best friends with Bill Clinton, you can't, it, 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 it was, it, ch it changed my life forever. He taught me how to be a better person. And it's why when he died, he was one of the most revered people in the world. You know, he, he just, people knew that he, George Herbert Walker Bush is one of the greatest men whoever occupied the office. For years, I was angry at Hugh Seide for dying before President Bush. Hugh Seide was a great presidential historian who worked for Time Magazine. And Hugh covered every president from Eisenhower through President Clinton, I think. And he once told me that George Bush is probably the best man to ever occupy the office. He said he may not necessarily be the best president, Gene, but he was probably the best man to ever occupy the office. Yeah. And I forgot to put that in the book, which I can't believe I forgot to. Oh, you put can that put in it the in the second edition. Because very I, very 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 may, I ask, may I ask my colleague a question, Christopher? Uh, to yeah. be a speechwriter for George Herbert Walker Bush is roughly like being the radar operator at Pearl Harbor. So <laughs> what was that like? <laughs> the man well, never had a subject and a predicate that met. Well, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll answer that elliptically because we were talking uh, a moment ago about what a, what a, what a, what a good writer uh, he was. I mean, he, he, he really was these pieces that these six essays that he wrote for me, I didn't, I, I didn't ch have to change a comma and it always, it, you know, it, it's, and I, I wasn't surprised when he announced finally, after being asked, you know, time and time again, when he said he wasn't going to write uh, a, a memoir, um, and 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 the reason for that uh, gets uh, to his to his most to his innermost decency, which was that he wasn't about him; he was about you. And you know, uh, not not an entirely uh, common trait in 
perhaps U.S. presidents or, or at least alpha dogs. He, you know, remember he was, his nickname as a child was have half because he was always offering half of his sandwich or his baseball bat or, or whatever <laughs> to the other guy. And in a way, now this is going to be an elliptical compliment to uh, my, my, my colleague, Mr. Meacham. In a way, I'm, 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 I'm also glad that he didn't write the memoir because um, that sort of cleared the path for John, whose, uh, whose book is, I've read, and I, I've, I've read all of John <laughs> and paid full price for each one of them. <laughs> he would send me. But I, when I finished uh, his book on Mr. Bush, I was in tears. And I mean, I was in real uncontrollable tears. And it, because it left it struck me uh, with the force of epiphany that this man was the closest thing we will any of us see to the ideal of the Christian gentleman. Mm. Not a mean bone in his body. I never heard, oh, you know, I, I heard him maybe chafe about minor things, but there just wasn't a mean bone in this guy's body. Think of, you know, the Dana, Dana Carvey who made a, a fortune on, on his imitations. Not going to do that. Not going there. Wouldn't be prudent. And, and, and then Dana Carvey picks up the phone and here's Dana. <laughs> it's George. <laughs> it, it, it's an endless, or the friendship with, with Bill Clinton. It's an right. endless, it's a conveyor belt of grace. And, yeah. and forgiveness and selflessness that um, is I, humbling and staggering. And I think I am, the three of us are three of the luckiest human beings on this planet to have known this splendid man. So I write about the friendship with Dana Carvey. I love that you brought that up, Chris in the book and Dana gave me a quote to put on the back of the book, which I'm going to read to you. No one said, nah, gah, da, <laughs> not going to do it quite like 41. <laughs> I am honored that our friendship is part of this funny, insightful book about a man I came to greatly admire. I mean, it, it, you, it, you can't make this stuff up. It's, it's, um, uh, to become friends with Dana Carvey, who he actually had at the White House to come imitate him is, is just wonderful. And I, you know, we have a lot of questions coming in. I'm going to have to do, I'm going to do a hard stop right now, uh, only because this is the Dallas World Affairs Council. I do feel, gentlemen, that we need to spend a couple of minutes talking about world affairs. So I'm going to let you two collect your thoughts because I'm going to come back to you in about three minutes, and I want you to share just sort of maybe the last time you saw him. I don't want you to make us cry, but both of the last time you saw him is in the book. So I would love for you to talk about it a little bit. But for the World Affairs Council, I'm going to do one excerpt from the book. I am not going to tell the story about when he called Prince Bandar of Saudi Arabia to ask him if he were dead or alive. John Meacham will never talk to me again because I did not give him that story yeah. for Destiny and Power. I it, held out it, on him. It's actually a sign of my grace that I'm here. Well, I, you know, John, I, you know, I couldn't, I, I didn't need to tell you everything. So anyway, instead, I'm going to read you an excerpt. In 2007, the president of the United States, that would be George W. Bush, invited Vladimir Putin for a summit meeting at Walker's Point in Kennebunkport at his parents' home. Truly, the whole, the whole story of Putin's visit to Kennebunkport is one of my favorite parts of the book. There was so much going on before, during, and after that visit. But I'm just going to read you one short part. This is about when the Russian advance team came to Walker's Point to advance the visit of Vladimir Putin. 
A few weeks before the Putin visit, the White House and Kremlin advance teams arrived at Walker's Point for a preliminary walkthrough. Thankfully, Joe Hagan, he was a deputy White House chief of staff and worked for President Bush 41 as well back in the day. Joe was head of the White House team. My job was to escort the large group around Walker's Point and keep my mouth shut. I almost made it. <laughs> it was a torturous meeting that went on for hours. The Russians obsessed about every rock along the jagged Atlantic coast, every lobster pot bobbing in the ocean, and every house along Ocean Avenue. They wanted snipers behind every boulder and an aircraft carrier off the coast. They wanted the Bush's neighbors to be moved out of their houses. Joe patiently and professionally talked them down from most of their demands. The very last discussion was the shortest. The plan for when Putin arrived was for the two presidents to get on President Bush 41's boat, Fidelity, and go fishing. As we stood on the pier from where they would depart, the Russians simply said something like, oh, okay, great. Tired, frustrated, and likely hungry, I could not help myself. From the back of the group, I said, let me get this straight. After all your concerns today, after every single blade of grass on Walker's Point, you have zero questions our concerns about the fact that these two world leaders are going to get on a boat with three 300 horsepower engines and driven in the often choppy Atlantic Ocean by an 83 year old madman who can and will outdistance every single boat the Secret Service has in about five minutes flat. I think we have a picture of them on the boat. If we can put up the picture of, of this famous boat ride, the Russians frantically started talking and speaking to each other in Russian. Joe Hagen gave me a withering look. Oops. Did they go fishing? Yes, they did. Did anyone die? No. Obviously, my concerns were overwrought. However, Joe does remember that his fidelity roared out of sight with the two heads of state on board, more than one looker, onlooker muttered, can I, I don't know if I'm allowed to say a bad word. Holy shit. It's Texas. But they did live right. to talk about it. I don't, unfortunately, I don't think we can find the photo. I'll just tell one more funny story from that visit. Uh, there was a state, there was a private dinner at Walker's Point, just the president and first lady, Vladimir Putin, George and Barbara Bush, I think the secretary of state, Connie Rice, the, the Connie Rice, the, the foreign minister, everybody else was downtown Kennebunkport at the River Club. And President Bush crashed that dinner, President Bush 41, after the dinner at Walker's Point. He, both the American and Russian teams were thrilled when he strolled in, just in time to catch the entertainment that he had arranged. His nephew, Hap Ellis, and his brother, Bucky Bush, strumming their guitars and singing their sometimes rather odd collection of ballads. <laughs> Bucky closed the night singing about a man who fell in love with a mermaid, but couldn't quite figure out how to make love to her. <laughs> As I noted in my diary, I think this was an important moment in American-Russian relations. How can you possibly hate a people who sing about mermaids? And after it was over, I was kissed by Russians I had never met before. I just wanted, I just wanted to share Great that story. excerpt. I, um, I think, however, we may have found the origin story to the attempts to undermine American democracy from Moscow. Well, oh, Bucky okay. Bush. <laughs> Bucky Bush singing the great late The mermaid Bucky Bush. frustrated love song. <laughs> you know, I have, I have to say, as I was sitting there hosting a table with the Russians and Bucky is singing about making love to a mermaid. I'm thinking, oh my God, 
I, I'm not sure how this will help relations exactly. But uh, anyway, it was a very, very funny night. I do want to take some of these questions, but well, why don't we take some questions and then um, we'll come back and ask the two of you just to talk about your um, talk about your last time with him. Oh, I have to take this question because it's from my editor, Sean Desmond at 12. Thank you, Sean. He wanted to know what it was like to go to a baseball game with President Bush. Did he focus on the pitching? Did he get relaxed or focused? Was he keeping score? What was he like to watch an Astros game with? Mrs. Bush kept score. Barbara Bush kept score when President Bush was captain of the Yale team and she kept score. Never did quit keep never did quit keeping score at baseball mm -hmm. games. President Bush or, was in, or 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 in life. Or, yeah. or, or in life. That would be true. Do that again. Uh, President Bush was an avid baseball fan. The biggest fight I ever had with him, and this went on for years, and I'm not making this up. I was a huge St. Louis Cardinal fan. You actually can see some St. Louis Cardinal posters behind me. He went to his grave feeling he had failed to convince me to become an Astros fan. But we're watching the Cardinals and the Astros here in Houston and the Cardinal slugger Albert Pujols hit a towering home run. And I said to President Bush, I said, sir, I just read that if Albert Pujols stays healthy, he likely will be the best hitter to ever play the game. Oh my God. You do not say that to a man who counted Ted Williams among one of his best friends. He was just furious. And he thought it was the dumbest thing I ever said. And for years, people would come up to me and say, did you really tell President Bush <laughs> that Albert Pujols might be a better hitter than Ted Williams? I said, yes, like two years ago. Well, he's still really mad about it. He just told us about it during cocktails. So he, it was a lot of fun Gene, going to games with him. He was intense. Gene, just quickly, you may remember when Ted Williams died, <clears throat> it emerged some days later that he had been uh, Austin Powers. Remember, he was frozen so that he could be brought yes. back to life. And I remember my phone rang one afternoon, and it was President Bush. And he said, is it true they stuck him in the deep freeze? <laughs> he was very interested in the deep freeze of Ted Williams. So. Oh, gosh. Um, yes, he was. He was fascinated by Ted Williams' head being frozen. I'm not sure what happened with all that. I'm pretty sure Albert Pujols will not have his head frozen. I, well, I, we don't know. I'm not positive. Let's not prejudge that. Oh, let's explain um, this more deeply. <laughs> <laughs> this, wait, by the way, wait. is a characteristic George Herbert Walker Bush conversation. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, somebody just asked about the legacy through his family. Please discuss how his legacy lives on through his family that have been or are currently in public office. You know, rather than talk about uh, public office, I, I, I think I instead will answer that question. One of the things about the Bush family that made President and Mrs. Bush so proud, uh, and they knew this before they died, is the huge, they all have a servant's heart. This family, from, from their five children to their grandchildren, any day now, their great-grandchildren will probably start doing volunteer work. They're all involved in charity activities. They all either head up nonprofit groups or volunteer for nonprofit groups. President Bush would always say that he learned from his dad, Prescott Bush, uh, that a life of service, that you had to have a life of service. And he certainly passed that on to his own children and grandchildren. So that service of legacy is, there's that good looking family. That service of legacy is just amazing. You could, I could go, I'm not going to, because we don't have time, but you could almost go through each and every one of these and they're all involved doing good work somehow. And a lot of them, of course, have run for office, might run for office. Um, 
they're not afraid to get into the ring. So it, it's a, definitely something that made President Bush very, very proud. Um, I'm going to just answer one more question, and then I want to I want to go back to John and Chris. Um, did President Bush blame Ross Perot for losing the election? Yes. <laughs> that's a very that's a very easy question to answer. Uh, we only have about ten minutes left, so Chris and John. I was there when both of you saw him the last time. Christopher, you came in the summer of 2018. I don't want you to make us cry, but just talk a little bit about that last visit oh, I talked uh, about in the book. I, I have a problem with your premise. You, <laughs> you talk about the last time I saw a man I revered as a father and not make you cry. I, uh, I'll back up a little bit. In uh, I, uh, I called him a few weeks after he had been defeated in, in, in 92 uh, to, uh, because the New Yorker magazine wanted me to do a piece on, on that remarkable uh, Lady Bush, uh, Dorothy Walker Bush. And I was, uh, I did with some trepidation. It was Sunday. It was uh, he was at Camp David, and you know here, here I am. He's 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 just you know lost the presidency, and here I am you know trying to get some quotes about his mother, his beloved mother who's just died. But bless his heart, you know he he returned the call, and he, uh, I said, well you know, um, how you doing? And he said, well, we, uh, okay. He said, I, we had a uh, memorial uh, uh, service here. Amy Grant, I think, was there. He loved country music. And he said, uh, I, he said, I, I just, I couldn't concentrate on the music because I, 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 I kept, I, I kept asking, saying to myself, hold back the tears, hold back the tears. The Bush, the Bushes, the Bush family has a, a saying for those who cry easily, and they and they all do. It's called the Ball Brigade. And he said, "If I, I knew that if I started uh, crying, I would be permanently ensconced as a member of the Ball Brigade." I would. I note that as I went through your book, Gene, every third page is drenched in some <laughs> crying because they love this man so much <laughs> but i point out as i learned early on as his uh, i wrote one of the early speeches i wrote was it was just a a, a sort of a nothing event he, he went out to the cia to to give a, a 10 minute talk and uh, he um he, uh, he started to cry because he pointed, he said, I have, you know, four flags in my office and uh, from my various postings and the, the flag that I hold dearest after the flag of our country is the CIA flag. And he started to cry. And I, I once remarked that for a, you know, a, a, a blue blooded New England um, Yankee, George Herbert Walker Bush had the tear ducts of a Sicilian grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so my last visit with him, um, I thought I, I, I had, a, I, I was having a hard time. Uh, I, but I did not want to be uh, permanently ensconced as a uh, adjunct uh, member of the Ball Brigade, and I. I just held his hand and we had a mm -hmm. martini and I, I managed to keep it together until I got into the car. And uh, I returned that car to Hertz uh, wet. <laughs> it, was, it was a sweet moment. I, you were just holding his hand and drinking a martini with him. It doesn't get more special than that. It doesn't Don't get I better than that. John, you saw him just a couple days before he died. Yeah, he, he died on Friday night, as I recall. 
uh, and the Tuesday before, uh, at the invitation of Secretary Baker, I um, was being Ed McMahon for a uh, conversation between uh, Secretary Baker and President Obama uh, at Rice. And uh, through Gene's good offices, I stopped by to uh, uh, say hello, uh, which turned into goodbye. Uh, and I had two of my children with me. Um, and Jean was very good. One of her many talents was she was very effective at what we in my family call buffering. You know, if you if you need to put some people into a room to buffer. Uh, and so I was sort of there to be, uh, Jean, to correct me if I'm wrong, I was sort of the air traffic controller for a bit between yes, Obama and you Bush. Were. Uh, so, um, and we... Gene tells this story uh, in, in, in the book. Uh, either you or President Obama, I can't remember. President, President Obama asked for the asked, room. Okay. He asked, asked for the room. For Neil Bush Obama. was also there, and President Obama said, can I have the room? He wanted to be by himself. Right. The right. first president. And so um, I made a decision that this was an important conversation and <laughs> so it should not go unrecorded uh so to speak so i quite uh unabashedly uh listened in uh from the hallway I, yes he, i caught him sneaking down the hallway <laughs> uh and i heard president obama say all of us take a lot of flack but you took flack for real. He was talking about World War II and talking about Chi Chi Jima. And I remember being struck by Obama's grace in that moment because he had no anticipation that anybody else was listening. He was paying a tribute. Uh, and Obama, by the way, is uh, wonderfully eloquent on the virtues of, of George H.W. Bush uh, publicly and, and, and privately. But, um, and then he came out and we, we, we took a picture uh, and then we had to change into uh, uh, monkey suits as uh, 41 called them. Uh, and so my son and I went upstairs and, and, and changed uh, as Evan, uh, his terrific medical aide and, and Jean took care of President Bush. And then I think I'm right, 72 hours later, he was gone. Um, to me, the, an iconic story, and this is my wasp distance, uh, actually, in the story that I think about maybe the most with President Bush is from 1985. And it's in a moment, it's, it's in a transcript of his diary uh, that we don't have the tape for that went, went, went astray at some point. And he's in Poland. And in what I would think of as one of the worst moments of White House advance, they take him into a, leukemia, a children's leukemia ward without having told him where he was going. Uh, and, of course, it evokes all the memories of Robin, uh, whom they lost in 1953. And he, the vice president then is standing with the, the banks of cameras behind him but he's facing the kids and he starts to cry. President Bush does, Vice President Bush. And he's saying into his diary later, here I was crying over these kids and I didn't want to turn around because if I turned around, it would all be about me and not them. So I hope this little Polish kid didn't think it was weird that this old American guy was crying over him. And I hope he just knows that I loved him. Mm. It's a great, it's, you know, how lucky we're out of time. So I'll just say how lucky were the three of us to know this amazing man. And, um, uh, Thanks to all the great stories that he left me. I, I hope 
I'm going to shamelessly plug the book and say, read the book because you're going to get to know him too. He was just an amazing man. And Chris and John, I could not have done this without you. And at that point, we'll turn it back over to Liz. Well, thank you. Wow. Uh, we knew that would be good. And it was an excellent conversation and of course, humorous to boot. So thank you very much. And before we sign off, I would just like to remind all of our viewers to pick up a copy of this book that Jean just showed. And you can go to our uh, partner our in, at Interabank Books, use the code DFW World, and you'll get 10% off your online cart. So uh, anyway, you can also catch up on our past programs on our YouTube channel at DFW World. So check it out. And if you're not a member of our council yet, please join us. I'd love to meet you. We're heading back to in-person before too long and we wanna see you there. So thank you very much to everyone again. Have a great night.